Welcome to the Shared Practices Podcast. This is season six on growth, which encompasses so many things. And I'm really excited for the dentist that's going to be on the show today. Um, I've actually been connected with this dentist a few times uh, via Wondrous, but via uh, Laura and Michael over at Wondrous. And just the both of us being overcommitted, it, it didn't line up the first time. So very happy to have Dr. Paco Major on the show today. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. And you know, you can speak for yourself, but I don't ever have anything going on. So I think, you know, that's how it goes. <laughs> we're going to put it all on me. You know what? It's, it's actually probably here. You were, you were probably available. Um, the one thing I will say is I have um, hired a, an amazing personal assistant who's an intern at Shared Practices now, who's a third year dental student. And he manages my emails, my calendars. And, and my life essentially at this point. And I so, got to get one of those, man. You I have am to. madly it, jealous and whatever your secret sauce is in finding these people, I, uh, my hat goes, to, uh, my hat goes off to you. I, I, I can't go back now. I'm too ADD and I've yep. real, I've just embraced like for a long time, I was embarrassed that like I needed help. I needed someone to like stay organized on top of things. And now I'm just committed. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a helpless, you know, ADD entrepreneur that needs help and it, and it works. So yeah. thank you. To Soren, shout out to Soren here. Yeah, Soren's the details guy, huh? That's that's right. So, well, um, let's let's introduce. I'm awful at reading bios and introducing people. Like, if you give yeah. me a long bio to to introduce uh, you, I, I just will get distracted halfway through. You have done a lot uh, in your career as a dentist. Share with our audience your entrepreneurship journey. Let's let's say starting with the beginning in dental school. Did you know that you were going to be a practice owner? And and what? was that like in your head? What did you think that was going to be? Yeah, I was just talking about this with a friend yesterday. When I was in dental school, I was contemplating getting my MPH and I was thinking to myself, you know, hey, what's the money like? You're essentially guaranteed $100,000 coming out of dental school. And I'm thinking, man, I'm living off like 1700 bucks a month, including <laughs> rents and thinking <laughs> quintuple my income and I'm having a good time right now. Oh, baby, it's going to be a real lot of fun. And then he started thinking about like, oh, what if I could do really well and, you know, double that money? It's like, who in this world could possibly spend that much money? Um, there are a lot of people, as it turns out, right? Oh, yeah. I, I just came from Disney World. It turns out you can spend <laughs> a lot of money really quickly uh, in a lot of ways. That just being one of them. Absolutely. And uh, you're a bigger man than I again here because I don't know if I could go with a five-year-old. I have a three-year-old as well. I don't I don't see that happening anytime in the immediate future. Yeah. She, the five-year-old was overheating and I, it turned out that um, if she just started to whine, I would spray her down. We got one of those like spray fans. Sure. She was just like overheating. And I realized day two, we're like, oh, if you just douse her every five minutes, <laughs> she's fine. You know, she doesn't overheat. So that's that's the secret. Keep that as, at home as a punishment tool, maybe, or something. <laughs> I felt like it was like the whining dog or cat and you spray it. I kind of felt like I was doing that to my daughter. I don't know <laughs> yeah, no. So in dental school, I, I had no idea about any of this. And it was, I finished dental school in 2010. It must have been 09 or 10 or something along those lines. I had heard about Dental Town for the first time. And this was at the time when uh, Scott Luna was making a name for himself on Dental Town. Oh, yeah. And I, I feel like that's the golden days of Dental Town is, is the early Scott threads. It must have been. And I was one of the early readers of, of that thread. And I actually did, t uh, took his class in 2010 when I was in my residency. And it just kind of got me thinking about, you know, the, the random parts that are associated with dentistry because, you know, we're all trained to be technicians and you don't even think about that stuff unless some outside source kind of brings it to you. Um, but I, I started thinking about that stuff, did a GPR for one year and right. took the class. And uh, as we were just talking, Richard, you know, right at the intersection of uh, ballsy and stupid <laughs> is right where I was at 27 years of age. I'm over a million dollars in debt, uh, building a scratch practice in Albuquerque, New Mexico nice. with zero patients. And your back kind of goes to the wall and you think, well, got to do something now. So I worked really hard and uh, used used consultants uh, back then as well. And you, you just work hard and you make things happen eventually. And you screw a lot of things up along the way. You make a lot of mistakes and you, you know, some you learn from better than others and you, you learn and eventually we ended up doing okay in, in that. So fast forward to 2014 bought the second office in Albuquerque and that was not a scratch practice, which was nice. Okay. And then the family dynamic thing happened. My wife and I had our first kid, second kid on the way. And so we made a decision to move back to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where we're from. Nice. 
fulfilled a two-year commitment, sold my practices to Heartland Dental in 2015. Okay. Stayed on for two more years and then moved up to back here to Milwaukee to to work and Heartland built me an office and things are going well at the time and I was having fun with them and they were having fun with me. So I thought for a while that I was going to stay there for the rest of my life. And things kind of happened and I realized in my time mentoring with, for the company because I was um, clinical director of implantology, I helped develop their, their curriculum. I spent a lot of time mentoring in other offices. I realized that I enjoy it and I'm not all that bad at it. So, hey, let's try this and put a little bit more of my own skin in the game. And that's when I branched off a couple of years ago and started the current iteration of, of what I'm doing here. I love your um, the name of your kind of practice group, if we want to call it Major Dental Partners, Paco Major. I, I feel like if you'd been in the Army and, and become a major and, and been Major Major, like, you know, there'd be a, a few layers deep that we could go with this. But um, so yeah. so tell us about this. Was the first one via acquisition? Was it via startup? How, how'd you do this? So I got I got to start off by saying that the folks over at Wondrous, I, I was bouncing around ideas. I just didn't know what the heck to name this thing. And I thought to myself, how about major dental partners? That'd be kind of cool. But man, that just, man, it makes me sound so arrogant. I really don't want to make it about me because it's about the the docs I work with, right? But due to a just absolute lack of creativity for anything else, we just stuck with major dental partners. Well, well, this is me coming in. I I just bought McCall Dentures and we named it Indiana Dentures and Implants, which is like the most boring, lame name on the face of the planet, but it is very descriptive. You cannot like mistake what is going on. It's in Indiana, it's dentures and implants. So I, I appreciate the lack of creativity. Let's just <laughs> call it what it is and move forward. Well, I really hope that you don't have to bring an endodontist on board. That would really confuse people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we've committed. We're, we're now, you know, Kane's chicken. It's like, you know, you're getting one thing. That's, that's yeah. what we're doing. So. Uh, Perfect. Tell us about this, uh, you know, version two of practice ownership for you. Yeah. So it, it's, it's really exciting. It's a lot of work. It's um, a lot of growing pains with this as well, but I have essentially a couple main goals for myself or for, for my organization is I, I, I do well practicing. I enjoy it. I'm good at it. I still practice three, four days a week, but I really enjoy the, the mentorship and growth development of things and Mm. what i what i truly personally get passionate about is developing doctors right i I love taking care of patients absolutely love working with the teams and you know i we tell this to our teams all the time that they are much more important to me than my patients because if i get a bad review from a patient it makes me have a bad day and i definitely don't want that but if i have bad review or or a or a staff member leaving me that that hurts a lot more and i know that if we take great care of our team in turn, the downstream effect is going to be that the patients are taken care of very well. Absolutely. So, so I, I really focus on developing doctors, and there's no one particular thing. It's I, I'd like to think it's a holistic thing. You know, we got to build them up as leaders uh, within the team, make them effective at communicating with their team, make them really strong at presenting uh, to patients to make sure that we can we can get treatment closed because it doesn't matter how great you are at that molar endo, at that implant, at that MOD, whatever it is, if you can't sell it in the first place. Mm. And then a, a certainly a big part of it is, especially with my younger docs, is making sure that we can get them clinically up to speed and, and competent at fast to dentistry beyond just doing fillings and crowns. Okay, cool. So I feel like this is promised to so many young dentists. They <laughs> They get told, hey, I, you know, I'll mentor you, come work for me. Um, And what ends up happening is they come work for a dentist who takes more time off and isn't there when they're there. And they send them the procedures they don't want to do. And all of a sudden it's like, well, what about all these implants, molar endo? So I think this is done very poorly by many people. Um, So I'm, I'm interested in how you're actually doing this. You know, what does it take to grow uh, someone up in, in all of these areas, because a lot of times too, um, a dentist will have a practice and they want to do all these things, but they have no clue. How do I train another doctor without imposing my treatment philosophies on them and my style of leadership? And how do I communicate this? Like, how do I 
help someone be better at some of these very nebulous things in terms of case acceptance, leadership, and and their clinical skills. So um, let's let's take them kind of one at a time. Um, leadership, like what do you what do you even do? Like, is this a series of conversations? Is this like books? Is this sending them away to courses? Or or how do you train leaders within your practice? It's all that. I mean, Richard, you can take it away here. It's everything, right? It's um, yeah. So in, in terms of leadership, we we really focus on that. I, I really like to start out with uh, audiobooks and podcasts. Just I tell them, hey, look, when you're driving 20 minutes to work and and to and from, just just spend 20 minutes listening to this. And I think the big thing that people get caught up with this is, oh, well, in my first two hours, there were no aha moments that made me better. It's like, no, and you're not going to either. But if you just slowly let this stuff permeate in over the course of several books or, you know, dozens of hours of listening, you're going to you're going to get a thing or two here and there and understand that, you know, it's, for example, you know, what you say and what are heard can be different concepts. Yeah. Uh, it, servant leadership is something that we really, really like to focus on. So I you know, I'll always tell my doctors, you know, hey, look, I'm not going to force you to, but I promise you that if you are willing to stay till the end of the day and be the last one to leave with the last team member, you're going to produce X percent more. You're going to have a way more committed team because at the end of the day, when you're leaving that treatment room and you tell the patient need, they need the crown and then they immediately ask the, the DA or the hygienist, do I really need that crown? I think that if you stayed last night till the end of the day with the, with that DA and helped her clean up the last operatory, I think you and I both know if she's more or less likely to say yes or no to that patient. Absolutely. So I, okay. So this concept of servant leadership, I think this is, um, it's something that like takes a lot of humility to do of like, uh, all of dental school and all of like being a doctor kind of is the opposite of that. It's like my time is the most precious and everyone else should be maximizing everything else they can do. So only, you know, I come in and do only the things that the doctor can do and everyone else does all the other stuff. And so I never have to do those things. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a big ask to kind of like get someone to switch gears and say, okay, I'm going to serve my team, even though I'm the leader and my time is very valuable and I'm the one doing these valuable procedures. I'm willing to, when needed, step in and help clean, help uh, sweep, help, you know, clean not, not that everyone has to clean the bathroom but if if needs i scrub be. toilets yeah okay we, we had uh this is now a, a couple of years ago we had an old incontinent lady um nobody wanted to do it i didn't want to but i'm the one who ended up taking care of it and they still tease me about it and it didn't smell very nice in that bathroom but it, it, it's an important thing that they understand who you are i think to your broader point um i'm guessing you know who patrick lencioni is yeah Mm -hmm. Yep. So I love his books. I love his stuff. Uh, for anyone who's practicing right now, if you're not doing team meetings, shame on you, you need to be doing them. And at your very next team meeting, you can go on YouTube and find a 35 or 40 minute version of the five dysfunctions of a team. And that has so much gold in it. I've seen it. I don't know how many dozens of times right now, every single time I get something good out of it. And if you're not wowed by it, then you and I are not speaking the same language. Yeah, but, One of the, we did a whole episode on that um, with oh, Reese Harper back in season five when great. we did leadership culture and change. He had had his whole company at Dennis Advisors read that and then incorporated that. And we talked about like where people struggled or stumbled and and how they were trying to really deeply embed the, the five dysfunctions of the team. Um, so so like I'm I'm gonna pump you for a reading list here real quick. Of, yeah. If if you had you know five books or three books, what are the three that you or the five that you start with, um, and have people read? Yeah, so I, the the cliche answer, and I stand by this, is going to be Simon Sinek, right? right? So start with why leaders eat last is fantastic. Uh, chapter I think it's chapter eight EDSO talking about the happiness hormones of endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. I play that for my team as well, and for the first couple times they hear it, they think, well, what does this have to do with dentistry, right? But it's a, it's a really, really big deal. Uh, the Infinite Game from him is a brilliant book as well. Patrick Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Um, gosh. Uh, Extreme Ownership and Dichotomy of Leadership by Jocko are fantastic. 
I give my people David Goggins as well. You know, we nice. all at times uh, feel bad for ourselves. And if you feel bad for yourself after listening to that, then again, we're not we're not speaking the same language here. <laughs> Just a uh, hundred miles uh, like off the shelf. Let's do an ultra marathon. There's so many chapters in that book that you're just like Goggins, you're out of control. Yeah, Very he's inspiring. certifiably insane, right? Yes. But there's something yes. good to get out of it. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> those 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 are good starting points. Um, I, I like uh, Dave Ramsey's Entree Leadership is another good one. I mean, they're all there. There's no there's no magic answer and they all say variations of the same thing, right? Daniel Pink's drive is another really good one that makes you understand. I think that if you can get a dentist to, to listen or read that, and then they would truly understand what makes their team click. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think there's so many things to it and getting to your point of, you know, humbling yourself to do these things, to be a servant leader. I think one of the great things I've heard Patrick Lencioni say in one of these podcasts is, talks about so often in corporate America, somebody works their way up that ladder so that, hey, I made it, I'm a VP, thank God, because I don't have to do that stuff that, that I had to do that I didn't like as a director. And then I'm CEO, thank God, because now I no longer have to do those things that I had to do as VP and I hated. His whole point is, no, 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 now is not the time to be happy that you don't have to do those things. Now is the time that you have to run to those things specifically because if yours, if those below you see that you are running away from problems and you're just delegating them out. Um, it's a trickle down effect. You know, if you run to your problems, so will those who work around you. And so that, that's a really big thing. And look, I'm not here to tell you that I'm perfect by any means. Seeing kids is not my cup of tea. Um, <laughs> I don't mean that. I don't do hygiene checks for kids really anymore. I think the team understands that pretty well, whichever office I'm in. But uh, I, I try to live my life like that. I personally call every patient who's gotten a needle from me that that night or the next day, if it was an afternoon patient, almost without fail. Mm-hmm. I personally stay to the end of the day at least four of the days a week uh, because I think people people see that. They pay attention. Nice. Um, th- there, There's a, a book... Uh, I, got, I got to pull this one up. Um, he was talking about the All Blacks, uh, which is a uh, New, New Zealand. Zealand. Yeah. Um, and, and they talked about the concept of sweep the sheds and the rugby team, this professional rugby team at the end of the day, they sweep and clean up their, their like locker room okay. area. Yeah. Um, and that's part of their culture. And, you know, we read that when I was in residency in the army and we talked about, you know, it's like, that's the kind of servant leadership and like, the the humility and the willingness to just like I, I think everyone also needs to accept like you're a human like you you still go to the bathroom you still like have yeah. to take care of you know functions and clean up after yourself like that's just part of being human and and, and doing that for other people as part of being kind and, and all these other things so this has been this has been a great conversation you've got we're both excited about this so we, we got to move on otherwise we'll talk about this all day <laughs> um, so so now let's move to uh, we talked about leadership um, and communication, there was the clinical. There's one other thing that we missed. Treatment present, yeah, treatment presentation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we have uh, our doctors have the four fundamentals of of a doctor in terms of treatment presentation, and I hope I remember them right now. So, <laughs> we, yeah, exactly. I don't have any cheat sheets here, so maybe that's my first problem. Uh, first thing we got to do is we have to make sure we get a good solid transfer from the clinical team. We got to be able to appreciate this because how many times have we walked into a room, the patient is seated uh, completely horizontal and you walk in with the mask on. Well, now I guess we have to, but uh, you walk in, you don't shake the patient's hand again right now. That's not an issue. Um, And you just start going in your thing and you never even face the patient. You just, you're standing behind them. Right? So when my wife gave birth to my first, um, I always had this experience every time I had ever I've never been in the hospital. I had never been in the hospital before and I don't have any health conditions. So I'd go in if you have a sore throat or whatever, and then you check in, you say, they say, what, what brings you in today? I have a sore throat. And then you wait 20 minutes and the medical system comes and gets you. And then they bring you back to the room. So what brings you in today? And then, okay, well, hang tight. The nurse will be right in. You wait another 10 minutes. She comes in, he comes in. So what brings you in today? Mm. And then, oh, wait, that's great. You know, we got all the information we need. Doctor will be in in a few minutes. Doctor comes in. So what brings you in today? And I'm thinking, man, 
why am I re-explaining myself a hundred times over? This makes, it's just bonkers, right? Like, do you people right. not have any form of communication? And with, the real answer the, is no. 10 to 15 minutes in between, you're like, you could have met each other in the yeah. hallway. You were gone for so long. Yeah. Something could have happened behind the scenes. Or you could have told me that you were running two hours behind in the first place. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so then on the flip side, I had the experience when, um, when my, when my oldest was born, um, it was a true thing of beauty. These absolutely wonderful OB nurses, they'd come in, do their 12 hour shifts. And it was wonderful. They had their notebooks where they said, Hey, this is Nicole major gave birth to Michael at X o'clock with this, you know, he's, he's doing this and that with this conditions. And they would just look at their notes, write down the next notes. And it was, it was such a great transfer that made me feel so good about myself thinking, man, these ladies are on it. They're so good. I don't have to explain anything to them. They know all about my, you know, the pain regimen, all that kind of stuff. And I thought to myself, this is just such a great opportunity. Why are we, and we, you hear this with patients all the time. Oh, the last guy, I didn't even see him. He was just behind me and said something to the hygienist and walked away. Right. Right. So, so having the the proper transfer, I, I just feel is a very important thing. It allows us to be a human to them. Mm. I personally, and I'm not, I never tell anyone how to do this. I never introduce myself as Dr. Major. I don't think I ever have in my life. I'm Paco Major to my, to my patients, right? Because people are scared enough. We're putting up enough barriers to begin with. People are not maybe in their, their element when they're at the dental office. So I want to make sure people are comfortable and I want to develop a a rapport or some type of personal connection, you know, Hey, what do you do for a living? I'm a nurse and I could leave it at that. Or I could try going just a little bit deeper and say, Hey, what kind of nurse are you? Right. I'm a, I'm a NICU nurse. Awesome. Let me tell you this story about one of my favorite patients ever. She was a NICU nurse who took care of my son, you know, when he was born, something along those lines, all of a sudden, I'm not just the guy asking, how's the weather. I'm a person who actually they might care about or have some type of positive feeling towards. So there's an art to quickly getting to a deeper level of, you know, a relationship without having to spend 45 minutes getting there. And, yeah. you know, some, sometimes we go too far to the other direction. Sure. But so that I think the transfer is really big and underrated. Uh, do you have your team like reporting to you with you in the room of like everything that's gone on. So it's like the patient can kind of see the transfer happening. Yeah. So, all right, Mr. Lowe. Um, hey, I got a minute to chat about things with Courtney, if it's okay with you. She's going to sum it up in front of both of us and make sure that we're all on the same page. And at that moment, I'm facing you. And then I go sit next to you and we're both in what's called a two-on-one transfer mm. where we're both uh, facing the hygienist. So it's not the dentist and the hygienist facing the patient. I think that's a really kind of just subtle tweak that makes them more comfortable. But yeah, we always we always like to summarize things. Nice. And I like how you kind of let them know that's going to happen and like ask and make sure that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then you you join up next to them. So it's not this like awkward conversation that's happening about them behind their back. Totally. Um, no, I love that. I love the, uh, the little tweaks, the little details of, that you guys have figured out with that. So um, yeah, I mean, we, we could spend several hours at least just going over these four fundamentals. I'll, I'll get into the next one here is um, yep. intraoral photos. Uh, it sounds silly and almost obvious, right? But in my offices, every single operatory has intraoral photos and on every patient, especially new patients, we demand that we take photos. Um, and as you've probably seen, there's a quite a we'll call it a discrepancy of what a, what classifies, right. In terms of quality of photos, if is sure. there saliva, is it blurry? Is it too close, too far, whatever it is, we really work hard and, you know, on our new employees, we really make sure that they're adequately trained up on that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm coming from the whole extra land of residency where you're doing the mirrors and the DSLRs and the mid surgery mm -hmm. photos and all of that. And so, you know, it's like once you get used to that and, and the patient being able to see what you see, it's hard to go backwards. And it's like sometimes I'm like, OK, intraoral with a wand is good enough. Just like if you yeah. the team doing that well, that can be enough that the patient sees exactly what's going on. You can have a conversation, co-diagnose, um, but that takes training and it takes holding your team to a standard and making sure that not only are we using it, we're using it correctly. And then it's up in front of the patient. The patient has the chance to input and and see what's going on in the way yeah. that we do 
And, and let's put a pin in accountability. I think that's something we can talk about later. That's a big part of the leadership aspect of things as well. But but yes, I, I've used the fancy expensive cameras. Mine are 120 bucks or something akin to that on Amazon. Nice. And you know, if, if, if a team member or you happens to drop it and it gets damaged, unplug it, put it in the garbage, grab the next one. Right. Uh, it just it just works. Yeah. So cool. Okay. So we talked about the handoff. Uh, we talked about photos. What's next? Yeah. So this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Let's talk about getting to the emotional level. So talking about the problem, the consequence and the solution and the benefit of getting whatever the condition is taken care of. So we are trained as mechanics in dental school. And, you know, if you worked for Howard, then you know, he always talks about that. You know, dentists, we're, we're, in, we're inherently geeky people. We're science right. nerds. Um, many of us are probably not, uh, probably don't have a sales background or some type of, you know, theater background or whatever it is. And I was a chemist. I was an organic chemist before I went to dental school. And so I was a very technical kind of guy. But as it turns out, patients don't care about craze lines as much as we do. <laughs> <laughs> Newsflash. <laughs> or, or progressive strength or, you know, marginal gaps. Like how many microns is this? Yeah. Uh, you know, they don't care. Yeah, or how many megapascals your bonding yeah. agent is, all that kind of right. stuff, right? People care about how is this going to affect my life? And it basically has come down to three things, pain, time, money. Uh, hey, look, Miss Jones, if we don't take care of the decay underneath this filling, it's going to get into the nerve of the tooth. And at that point, it's going to cause you pain. It's going to be more expensive to take care of. And then when we get to the time aspect, hey, these things, they never happen on a Monday afternoon. It's always on a Friday night. And I like you, but I'm not coming here Friday night to take care of you because I got my life to live as well, right? And I, I try to work with kind of humor and, you know, I'll, I'll pretend that I'm funny and then my whole team is going to very quickly correct that to say that I think I'm funny. But I, I try using humor with my patients to kind of put them at ease a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so you really not conveying the details of treatment, but conveying the benefits and of, of getting treatment done and what will happen if you don't get treatment done. Um, yeah, because ask, ask a new grad, hey, you got this amalgam with craze lines and recurrent caries. What happens if we don't get it taken care of? Well, craze line is going to go deeper and at some point it might get into the, to the pulp, right? And then we have, uh, you know, acute uh, irreversible pulpitis, whatever it is. So we got to go in there and do the endo. We got it to bride and clean in shape. And then we got to go ahead and obturate. Oh, and well, let's talk about how, what kind of, oh, do you like wave one? Do you like pro, you know, uh, <laughs> what, what, what system do you like to use? And do you like to use warm vertical? Do you use gutta core or whatever it is? Um, there, there's all these rabbit holes of technical details that you and I care about, but mm -hmm. I promise you, I mean, every now and then you're going to get a hard C patient, right? We use the disc system. Yes, yeah. Uh, we're going to get a hard C patient who's going to ask those questions. But with those patients in particular, I'm going to go out of my way to not mention any technical details mm. because then I don't want to go into a 20 minute discussion about the merits of the zirconia yeah, versus lithium disilicate and why are there different types of lithium disilicates and what about PFMs and whatever it is. Interesting. So rather than indulge the C, you just avoid that minefield entirely. <sighs> I try to, for the D's and C's, I try to say one or two things that are going to make me sound kind of smart and authoritative. And then I don't really open up the door to more technical questions. Not always, right? But that's a general type of thing. Mm. I love but, that. Especially no, with the D, you, ha you have to sound smart, right? Because I'm, yeah. I'm a D personality. And if I go in for something, if I know that this person's legit and know what the heck they're talking about, Okay, you tell me, man. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I, either right. I've made my decision, I trust them, and I like them, and if, and if both boxes, if both of those boxes are checked, I'm going to do it. Nice. Uh, no, that's great, and I love that you know you're tweaking the case acceptance to those personalities because you just you learn real quickly if you do the same thing for every patient, it's not going to go well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so are we on pillar four now? Yeah. So the third is, you know, describing things in a in a, an emotional manner to how is this going to affect my life? And I'll just quickly say one thing when I'm training with my docs is sometimes I will make them write down on a piece of paper as we're practicing this. Miss Jones, I am afraid that if we don't address X, then Y will happen. 
And that just kind of puts it in people's heads of, wow, I really have to explain how their life is going to be affected as a result of this. So that's that's like the the fundamental framework of if you're going to like say a sentence to patients about why they need to get treatment done, that's mm-hmm. like the fallback. That's every, every yep. day. I love that. Um, okay, cool. So then pillar pillar four. Four. Let's get a close. So we've all had the situation where we talk with a patient about they need whatever, two endos, three crowns, six fillings. And we talk about it for five minutes and then, hey, does that all make sense to you? Yep. Any questions? No. Cool. Well, I'm going to have the ladies come back here and go over the finances and scheduling. And let's, I'll, I'll see you later. Sound good? Yep. Bye. Okay. Do you have any idea if the patient actually wants to do the treatment or not? They didn't, they never even got asked. They never got asked. And so what's stopping us from getting that definitive yes from patients? It's not the patient. It's the dentist. We are so afraid to sound pushy to patients that we're not getting that definitive yes or no out of them. So, we, and we don't want to feel pushy. We we don't want to be rejected. I think that's a combination of the two. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I like people. Look, I like people. I want to be liked. It affects my mood that people like me and don't like me. And we get enough as dentists of, oh, well, I hate the dentist. No offense, I like you, but I just hate, it's, you know, we, we get enough of those conversations on a regular right. basis. We don't right. want to keep digging our, our psychological holes here. So what I try saying is there are just many different ways of getting that, that confirmation, yes, no, out of, out of someone. You know, if I want to be really direct with someone, I'll say, hey, is there anything stopping you from getting this treatment done today? That's pretty bold in your face, right? Or if I want to be a little bit softer, I'll say, hey, look, what are your thoughts on getting this done right away? Right away could mean right now after your hygiene appointment. Right away could mean later today or next week or whatever it is. It could just mean before it starts causing you problems. And then there are just a myriad of, I have, I don't know, we use probably seven to 10 different type of closed statements that you can kind of custom tailor to your patients. Yeah, it sounds like we need like a whole nother episode on that. Um. <laughs> so it's funny. I actually, I, at, at the local dental school at Marquette University, I help out with their as the business club and we go over some of these things. And it's kind of funny seeing from their point of view that they don't even understand that any of this stuff is an issue or that it, that it exists whatsoever. And you give them six closing statements and they're like, what is a close whatsoever? I was going to say, I bet they don't even know that language is so foreign. You know, they haven't done sales. They don't, that's not mm-hmm. their world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in our part of our orientation for our new docs, you ever seen, uh, what is it? Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Yeah. Always so, be closing. Yeah. Always be closing. And you know, that's maybe not appropriate for this, uh, for this vehicle, but it's a fun <laughs> way of kind of making people understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and and I mean, I so we had Dan Pink on the podcast, um, and to sell is human, and we talked about you know mm-hmm. persuading other people. That, you know, a lot of people have this like guilt yeah. of like, well, I can't sell. Yeah. I'm a dentist. I'm I'm a. Uh, they trust me, and I have more information than. Them. Well, it's like, well, no, they're either going to go buy a boat or an iPhone or an, or an iPad or spend it on whatever, or take care of their oral health, and you're helping them make decisions in their best interest. Yeah, you you are not competing with the dentist on the other side of the block or a mile over. It's just to some degree, I suppose. And, you know, it sounds brutal saying that in Wisconsin, maybe in Salt Lake or Los Angeles, it's different, I suppose. But we are competing way more with couches, TVs, yep. Disney trips, all that kind of stuff than we are with other dentists, right? And um, I'm going to totally rip off um uh, I, I totally ripped this the saying off of uh another dentist and I but I still teach it to my people. Chris Nybauer said that selling in dentistry is convincing people to do the things they need to have done but don't want to have done because it isn't currently hurting or giving them any problems. And I will and and you worked for Howard, you know this. I mean, he talked all the time about, you know, these women who were never told that they had perio disease and all of a sudden they're 50 years old and they need their teeth out. I will never apologize for selling as much dentistry as I can with, with that being the definition yeah. to, um, 
to, to make sure that I can help my patients out as much as humanly possible. And if it turns out that they just don't care and they'd rather have an ATV, fine. I, it's, but it's my job to educate them on that. Right. And, and, and give them the, the best chance possible of taking care of themselves. So <laughs> totally. totally. Um, okay. This, this has been awesome. So w- one question I want to have is, you know, you've talked about orientation, you've talked about team meetings, how much of this is you training the doctor versus you training the team? And are those the same thing? Are you doing both at the same time? Or is there separate time when you're you and the doctor and you're kind of like focusing on behind the scenes type stuff? I think this goes back to what you were talking about earlier with everyone promises mentorship to new dentists, right? And I promise it. I, I like to think we deliver on it. I know when I worked for, for Heartland Dental, they they promised it and you know they, they do their things and they have a pretty robust uh, curriculum for their young dentists. And I, I, I would assume just about every DSO is going to do that. And I would assume that just about every private practicing doc who's looking at adding doctors on is going to be saying that as well. I think where the rubber hits the road, though, is how much time, money, and quite frankly, emotional energy are you willing to put into someone yeah. to make them better? And so when you say, well, who teaches the team and all that kind of stuff is... You know, rather than give my dentists the fish of just training their teams for them, I'd much rather give them the lesson and the pull, make them a stronger leader so that they can do that. Because at the end of the day, what I don't need, it's nice, but what I don't need is for all the teams in every office to love me personally. Mm. I would much rather have them loving and being loyal to their doctor so that way they can uh, be the strongest leader for their team and ultimately need me less for purely selfish purposes. I I say that. Yeah, no, as an entrepreneurial dentist, it's like, there's always more to be done. And, uh, honestly having exactly what you just said of a team who loves a doctor and has their back is the thing that is the hardest thing to do because they they're working together all day, every day. And if the doctor can earn the trust loyalty, respect of their team, then so much of, of the complications of, of drama and problems that come up get solved. Uh, with that. There, and there's still, there's still issues. It's still not perfect, but at least everyone's rowing in the same direction. So your goal, you, what you're saying is rather than you come in and train in on all these things, ideally you're giving the doctor the tools to be able to turn around and train the team on this. So then the doctor gets kind of a double exposure. Number one, you teaching them or giving them the tools to, to educate themselves. And then number two, for me, this is actually when I, when I learn the most and why I have a podcast is that I learn by synthesizing. See one, do one, teach one, right? Yeah. I, yeah. If, I, if I can't teach it, like I don't know it. And that's just the honest truth. And yeah. that's the way that my brain works. And so I think that's pretty fundamental to most people, but it's uncomfortable. And a lot of people don't want to do that. Um, and turn around and teach other people. But it seems like you've got everyone bought in on this idea. You, you have to. And look, if, if you've got your brand that you're going for, Richard, then you, you have to know that you go for a culture and a brand that you need people to buy into. And truth be told, it's not the fit for everyone, right? And, and that's okay. Um, uh, we had a doc about a year ago or so. He was great guy, good doctor, good clinically, good with patients and super nice dude, but it just, it just wasn't the right fit. And so we had a frank conversation and said, Hey, look, let's just, let's go our separate ways because what you're going for and what I'm going for are not the same thing. And why, why go down this hole for longer and start getting to the point where there might be hard feelings because I have too much respect for you to do that to you. And I would hope it's, you know, the same thing in in the other direction. No, absolutely. Okay, so um, we've talked about leadership. We've talked about case acceptance. The last is clinical. Yeah, um, taking someone who's you know a new grad and is barely you know we all thought we knew a ton, but it turns out we were just barely not dangerous <laughs> at the time. Um, and then getting them up to speed on advanced procedures and doing advanced dentistry. Once again, this is something that a lot of people promise and few deliver on. Um, you have the advantage of you actually trained and taught this for Heartland. Um, so, so what were some of those things that you've brought and, and made you an excellent educator 
that now you have the ability to to do that for your younger doctors? Well, so truth be told, I mean, I, I, I certainly learned from my time with Heartland. I, I learned from my time. I had a couple of associates in New Mexico as well. And, you know, I've I've probably learned the most in the last couple of years since since I uh, uh, since I took this on. But I think to get Dennis trained up there, there are a lot of parts to it. And it starts with accountability of you have to set clear goals of what you want. You know, I talk with everyone that I that I everyone I talk with. We always talk about what do you want in your career? Um, I want to be a fee for service cosmetic guru. Great. So let's let's talk about what you need to do to get there. I want to be a, a just a run of the run of the mill, you know, crowns and fillings dentist. Great. I'm not the fit for you, but that's fantastic. I'm glad we knew that so we don't have to waste time and create hard feelings. Um, if you want to do a lot of surgery, fantastic. I'm going to get excited and we're going to talk for hours to the point where my wife is telling me to shut up about <laughs> talking about you because it turns out my wife doesn't love hearing me talk about dentistry all that much. And I, I can relate. Most of yours, I'm sure she loves listening to that, right? Well, when you talk shop. Beginning. While I was in the army, um, the podcast was, well, I'm still in the army for another seven, eight, nine days. Um, it was originally hers because I couldn't have outside employment How while funny. in the residency. So for a while, she was the uh, founder of shared practices. All right. Well, you're, you're a lucky man. What can I tell you? <laughs> but, but despite that, she's not really a listener and definitely gets sick of me talking about it all the time. So yeah, same problem. Perfect. Um, so I, I think we got we to gotta set expectations on the front end of what we want. And then I'll set my expectations of what I expect out of my dentist. I'm going to tell them, hey, look, we're going to have more fun. We're going to... We're going to do more cool things. We'll happen to make more money. That's a, that's a side benefit, right? But we're also going to work harder, and I expect more out of you than than probably most places are going to expect out of them. And I I feel like if you asked any of my dentists, they would wholeheartedly agree with you. Mm. I, I'm going to spend time, and our admin are going to spend time doing things like time studies. So you got a standard crown appointment, and you know, this is how many minutes you took to excavate the tooth. This is how many minutes you took to place the band and core in there. This is how many you took for your, your rough prep. We typically use a laser rather than cord. This is how long it took you to laser the tooth up and refine your margins to make it nice and pretty. This is how long it took you to scan the tooth. Um, and then, you know, what are your ideal times? Because, and what we typically find is the excavation and the core placement always take way longer. Everyone's going to say, oh, I did the, the prep in four minutes. I, aren't I awesome? Yeah, that's fantastic. But you took 24 minutes to, to excavate the, the caries out of the tooth, right? So it's not that impressive if you're still taking an hour with it. How do we get you down to the, the 20 or 30 minute crown appointment while maintaining absolute perfect quality with it? Because part of what we part of what we're doing is I encourage my dentist to have four and a half loops, for example, because I know that when you're using four and a half loops, all of a sudden your work just suddenly starts looking better. Right. <laughs> it's, I have yet to meet someone to tell me uh, with real world experience that that hasn't been the case. And they've all fought me on it. Don't get me wrong. They all say that it gives them headaches and they can't work with four and a half, but it is what it is. Um, but we're going to, we're going to do time studies. We're going to talk about, Hey, maybe you could do your excavation a little bit faster. I'm going to be on cases that they don't know how to do. I'm going to be the assistant or we're going to find a dentist who can be the assistant for them. I'm always open Friday afternoons to work on hard cases if need be. Uh, if you feel like you're sending too many molar endos out, why? Let's just start doing them. Give a couple away for free to patients if you can't find someone really easily to do that and we'll get it done. And I promise you, if we do five molar endos over the course of a couple of weeks together, you're going to start being a little more proficient and comfortable enough to do it on your own. I love that. Um, I also love the four and a half loops. The first time I put four and a half on in, in dental school, I was like, Did you feel drunk big, or something. Yeah. It's like a big cartoon <laughs> tooth. I'm like, it's like yeah. all, it's all there. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so, so I love that you've got time set aside where you will mentor, you know, this is, this is always available Friday afternoons. And then in addition, other times uh, I spend time shadowing them. Yeah. Doing time studies. And then, we recap and we write weekly or bi-weekly emails of these are the things we should be working on. We CC the office manager and the admin team and mm. people follow up. Hey, you know, two weeks ago we talked about you wanted to get better at lasering the tissue. 
and because you were taking too long with it or just wasn't good quality or whatever it was. How is that coming along? We hold accountability because that's really important because if we just say, these are the goals, go make hay, right? We know it's never going to happen unless we circle back and hold people accountable to their actions. All of this like makes me realize that this all takes a ton of work uh emotional um, energy was the phrase energy. I, I love that <laughs> phrase i i think that's fantastic that describes what this requires to like put your heart and soul into someone to help yeah. them become better um and that just doesn't happen in a lot of t- times and places because people don't have that emotional energy to turn yeah. around and reinvest in someone else because they don't care about these a lot of people are just kind of checked out of dentistry or or they have other priorities or you know they're they're not a ce junkie um, you know, they're not well, driven. Just, it's a delayed, re- it's a delayed gratification, right? There's no immediate ROI on this because it takes a while to build people up. Yeah. Um, I will say though, that this is a fun process, um, in terms of like, I, I, in the army, the one thing that kind of maybe made me think about staying for a little while was education and like the one year AGD, the two year AGD mentoring other doctors can actually be a whole lot of fun if you put your heart and soul in it. Yeah. And they're moving in the same direction. And it's like, we're, I I love how you started the conversation of what are your goals? What do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Where do you want to grow? And then that's what you're driving towards. It's not like, Hey, I want you to be faster on procedures because then you'll make more money for the office. It's like, no, we're, we're working on becoming the dentist that you want to be. This is part of it. And, um, we're going to hold you accountable and and we're going to follow up and we're going to get better together at this. Absolutely. And it, it, and I think it always needs to be stated and stated and restated that, hey, the, the money follows, right? The, you get, and this is what we talk about all the time with the team, if you get the, the right people on, on the bus, and that's another book, right, that people should be reading. If you get the right people on the bus and you provide them the right culture, and what I look for in a culture is a culture of accountability but safe space, right? So the people mm-hmm. are not afraid to make, I think I'm ripping that off of Simon Sinek, I believe. That, but where you have uh, progress or uh, excellence happens where you have a feeling of safety uh, where people are not afraid to make a mistake, but they're still being held accountable. Mm. So if you get the right people on the bus with the right culture, give them the right training and resources, whether that be physical equipment, because we have really nice equipment in all of our offices, um, or just the right systems and, and uh, streamlined processes, I know that those teams are going to take fantastic care of their patients. And then the end result is we can track the metrics of we did X number of fillings, crowns, implants, whatever it is, and then the money follows after that, right? We track the money, we track the metrics because the, you can put a number to that. I can't put a number on how safe my employees feel. I can't right. put a number on is this the right person? But if we know that one number goes sharply up or sharply down, then we can start looking in places. And all of this is so funny to me because um, when I was talking about some of these issues of like culture in season five to Michael Anderson from Wondrous, he's like, mm-hmm. you got to talk to Paco Major. He's like, he he is like thinking about how do we build cultures at multiple offices and build doctors and, and build teams that are all in the same direction. And uh, we should have had this conversation nine months ago. It's all my fault. So, um, all good, all good. As we've established, you got you got your uh, you got your help right now, which is really an amazing thing. Who he's up at, at Marquette. So, uh, uh, oh, Storm, perfect. Yeah, we we should connect you two. It'd be a lot of fun. I'd lo- I'd love to take him out to dinner. Absolutely. And that okay, we're we're gonna make it happen. So. Uh, Soren, if you're listening to this, let's let's get this done. Um, Shout out to Soren, yeah. Tell me where you want to go, Carnivore, maybe, or something like that. There yeah. you go. I'm sure he, I'm sure he knows <laughs> the good places. Um, so, lastly, here, you know, we we've talked a lot about doctor growth, um, and we've doc- talked about you know these different components and all the training that you put into place, the time, energy, emotional investment in, into these doctors. How do you also grow? practices let's have a a short conversation because we've already had a whole episode on this of like the marketing side of things because you're putting your heart and soul into this side of things um how much is left over for marketing and how involved are you on on your your three practices right now well so you know wonderist well and um uh, i i've been working with wonderist for for several years uh Mike and Laura are 
good personal friends of mine. Um, truthfully, I, I we do a monthly call. I hand a lot of that stuff off. I know enough to be dangerous. Nice. And I'm also smart enough to know that those folks know way more about this than than I do. So I'm just going to trust them with that. I think, at the risk of sounding maybe controversial here, I think that a lot of people really get worked up about new patient counts, right? Mm. And don't get me wrong, it's important. We need new patients. That's the lifeblood of of future production in, in the practice. But you can also look at, you know, what's the average annual production or collections per active patient within the practice? And I think that one thing that is so often missed is there are just all these opportunities within a practice that isn't that that isn't being realized within there that's why you can come in and that's part of what dso's have done right is they just have better business processes such that they can basically double the the production of an office without even needing any new patients in it because they understand things like text message appointment reminders or intraoral photos or whatever it is so i think that it's a big thing to get new patients but i think to me, I place even more emphasis on having the right systems in organization and office such that, yes, I would love to have more because eventually I'd love to maybe add a doctor or add a hygienist or whatever it is. But I think let's let's make the most of what we have first, and then we're going to trust the experts like the Wondrous Agency to make sure that we can get more people coming through the door. I love this from uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is that you've validated the order that I put my seasons in of the podcast, which was <laughs> we did uh, all the pre-ownership stuff was season one, two, and three. You know, we okay. did should I own acquisition startups? And then my thought was, let's start with case acceptance because what's the point in like ramping up marketing dollars if you can't get patients to say yes to treatment? 100 patients in, 95 patients out the back door that same month, right? Right. And and then the next season was leadership culture and change because it's the same thing. If we spend a ton on marketing, but then patients come in and there's this like tension in the office and there's things are broken and stuff falls apart and no one's accountable for anything. Um, once again, you're, you're wasting a ton of money. And, and to summarize, it, it seems like you don't need as many new patients because you do very well taking care of the patients that you have. And every new patient that comes in, your doctors do a great job of doing as much dentistry as that patient needs on them um, and getting helping the patients actually get that done. Yeah. So let, let's use for the example, one of my doctors, um, she is absolutely brilliant, great dentist. She graduated dental school just last year. Really fantastic. She wants to be eventually the kind of cosmetic gal in town, which God bless it. I love it, right? I do veneers, uh, you know, if I'm practicing full-time, I'm doing case a month or something along those lines. Sure. So I'm well enough versed. I know what I'm doing. I'm doing a good job for my patients, but I'm by no means, you know, a Craig Golden or one of these master AACD type guys. So let's get, let's get this dentist to that point. Does she need a hundred new patients a month to do veneers? Because maybe if you see 10,000 people, one person's going to come banging down the door saying, hey, I need veneers. Right. Or do you need to just be much better at talk, having these conversations with your patients? So I think that's, that's a really big thing. And that goes back to you know what you want to do. If, if you tell me, hey, I just want to be some filling crown dentist, maybe we do need 100 new patients a month for that dentist, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and um, but, but then once again, you kind of said that's not a good fit for, for you and what you're doing. Totally. Totally. I, look, and truth be told, I'd rather be better with my patients and have more new patients, right? It's not yeah. a, we don't live in a world of one or the other. We can have and, but it all starts, it's all predicated on the, on the premise of let's have the, the solid production per patient first. Yeah. And, and, and just in general, I just kind of love the idea that, you know, um, as, as a owner and a developer of multiple practices, you spend your time and energy training and developing people and you outsource the marketing, um, you know, and, and like you said, you know enough to be dangerous, but you also trust the, the people that you have on board with that. Um, and I think a lot of people want to be everything. They want to be yeah. the trainer. They want to be the marketer. They want to be the accountant. They want to be, you know, all of these different pieces. And it's like, well, figure out the stuff that you're really good at and the stuff that really matters. And for you, you've absolutely done that. 
Yeah. And I, you know, I, to, to give people another book, the, the Bible of business books is good to great. The Fox or the Hedgehog is yeah. I think what you're referring to there, but that, that's a really big thing. So I got a question for you, Richard, then. Sure. You spent three seasons of, do I start a practice? Do I do this or that? I think you kind of know where I'm going with things, but I, I want to know your take on if I'm some new grad or two years out dentist, you know, working some grinder or whatever, and I'm thinking about I want something more. Essentially, the options are lifetime associate, buy your own solo shop or partner into something. What's the consensus coming? And I have my personal take, maybe for selfish reasons here, that I think you know the, the partnership is the right path here. What are you seeing coming out here? We tend to attract people who are willing to listen to a podcast that's declaredly practice ownership focused. We tend to find people that are, you know, I'm going to own it or bust. You know, I, I need to have my own thing. And I, I have found out that I am one of those people that I, mm -hmm. I don't make a good junior partner. Like I need to be able to spend money on the stuff I want to and, and make mistakes um, and own those mistakes. And but but you're all right. So you're not you're the anomaly, right? I mean, right. What, and what do you think the anomalies? But but fair. By and far, <laughs> um, but it's interesting because we'll we'll talk with um, people who are listening to our podcast and they're like, no one else in my dental school class is even thinking about this stuff. You know, yeah. one person out of 100 plus is just their head is in this space and everyone else. It's like, I don't even want to think about that stuff. I just want to think about dentistry. I, you know, I'm not going to own, I'm not thinking about that. And I think these kinds of partnerships where you have invested um, leadership who cares about you as a person who is in the minutia and, and really helping practices to succeed is one of the best things on the table for young dentists. Um, because that's so hard to find. And that's where, like I said earlier, people get burned is they jump from associateship to associateship. Yeah. And, and, and end up, you know, having a bad experience and getting laid off during COVID and, and don't have job security. Um, so finding, and that's the hardest thing, is finding the right partnership, finding the right kind of match for this person can bring to the table the things that I don't have and that bring the best out of me. Um, and that's that's truly the the challenge of it is can they find you and you find them and it's the right fit on both sides. I can, uh, to, to, to purely give myself a plug here, I can, I can proudly say that last year when we shut down, I didn't furlough a single employee. Everyone got paid the whole way through. Nice. And I'll tell you at the time, it really sucked. And it, it was <laughs> a little scary. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm losing $30,000 a week here. What's going on? Right. But, uh, but uh, that was, I think that's one of the things we go for, right? Is to have that culture where people feel, people feel safe. But that was basically uh, a big part, getting at what you're getting at, is a big part of what made me do this is I feel, and maybe I'm just mistaken in how I think about this, 25 years ago, you could hang a shingle, not have to work that hard, and you would do just fine, right? And the uh, 1% to 4% of people that you attract with this podcast, which is fantastic, by the way, and I got into things similarly when I was a dental student, and you know, at one point I was a young buck. Um, and I think that's fantastic, but I think to the majority, there's a really kind of issue of either I have to buy my own practice and run myself amok, or I have to go work some associateship and private practice where I'm going to get abused and I'm going to get the kids in gaggers, or I'm going to have to run, uh, run some associateship at the DSO level where I'm just for whatever reason, not fulfilled. And this is not at all an anti-DSO rant at all. I think that they serve a great purpose um, for, for a lot of people. But I kind of thought to myself, you know, there has to be some, some middle ground where I truly believe that no one's going to live up to their potential if they don't have a skin in the game. They just, they just won't because they won't care as much. Yeah. So you got to get them to care. You got to get them to financially invest. So that way they care about things a little bit more. But I also know that my dentists don't have to worry about making payroll or, you know, think OSHA or whatever things along those lines. And if you made me do that, I don't know if there's enough money in the world that could make me an OSHA specialist or a pediatric dentist or whatever else it is. Yeah. Um, so you got to find what you're good at 
and outsource the rest and you know maybe let someone else take care of some of the more stressful parts to you so that dentists can focus on being a leader and being a great dentist absolutely and and i i think we're exactly on the same page of you know we've looked at what's being done and and said i think we can do this better and create a better place for people all the way across the board to work at than than exists elsewhere um and and that's a fun challenge of like can we create better partnerships, better opportunities, um, better, better opportunities to grow people and have them be really fulfilled in all aspects. Um, and that's, and that's a lot of fun, but not everyone wants that challenge. And, and so it's like, like we were saying that the right fit. And, um, so let's, let's circle back on the plug. If someone is interested, if they said, okay, I like this taco guy, uh, Dr. Major, I, I want to work with him maybe, um, what would be the next step to, to, find out more about you and your organization? Well, I wouldn't want you calling me Dr. Major. Paco works plenty fine. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have a, a website, majordentalpartners.com. You can email me there. Uh, should I give out my cell phone number? No. It's to you. I mean, right. uh, yeah, go for it. Let's do it. Let's see. All right. If, there if, you, if you text me in like a, a month and you're like, I, I regret it, we can come and edit this out. Perfect. Uh, area code 505-514. 3433 shoot me a text give me a call whatever works um i think getting to your question of well who is a good partner and i think you and i richard are going for the same thing here you want someone who's hungry because they want more and then humble enough to be willing to put in the groundwork to get there and i think similarly to you i put so much into my people what i don't want is to make someone or to help someone achieve you know their actualization and fulfillment for them to say you know what i'm leaving because i can make 50 grand more or 100 grand more down the street doing my own thing no i want i want someone who's going to be a long-term partner with me because i know that together we can be better and we can have more fun and ultimately be happier awesome no i love it and um i i hope people go major dental partners if, if they're in your market and uh and i guess also maybe define for them what would be your ideal kind of market and where where you're looking at growing so we're in metro milwaukee uh, milwaukee wisconsin which scares people because it gets cold here i guess if you're from <laughs> here it's just i mean <laughs> you know March and April aren't the most ideal months because you're ready for it to be warm. Finally, I think you right. got probably like six, seven degrees on us in Indy right now. Yeah, that's about right. Um, but I, we're, we're in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And, and to me, I care less about geography. I've practiced in New Mexico. It's fine. And it comes down to people. And I, I, I say this as a, as a true, you know, hometown boy that I believe that the patients are better here. I believe that the teams are better here. And for all the cliches and the, the Midwest values, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to, you know, I'm aboard that train. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the show. This has been a, a great conversation. I've had a lot of fun. Hey, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Awesome. We will talk with you all next time on the Shared Practices Podcast.